Congrats to us. Today, we are celebrating our 41st episode. Yep, we'll never be in our 30s again. (laughs) But we sure had some good times with all of these wonderful people. We sure did. Each and every one of those episodes, they're pretty special. I really liked them. Yeah, very creative people. Every single one of them. Yes, and we're heading into our 40s. And we have some pretty interesting and amazing shows ahead. Yes. Hi, everyone, and here we are celebrating what people love to do creatively by giving them a voice. I'm Rod Jones. And I'm Angie Jones. Welcome to the Thought Row Show. We invite you to follow us wherever you listen. And just to let you know, our episodes are always absolutely free to listen to. And of course, you can check us out at thoughtrowpodcast.com, where you can listen to any or all of our episodes on our website. Yes. And I like that part about free because actually some podcasts are now starting to charge, but I don't think you and I are ever going to go that route. No, I don't think so either. But you know what? We would love to hear from you. Don't be shy. You can always reach us through our website's contact page and let us know your thoughts. Yeah. And that is why it's called Thought Row Podcast, because we want to hear your thoughts because we can always learn from each other. Boy, I know I sure learn. Yeah. Before I ask you to share your quote, who are we going to be featuring on our new segment, which is called, What Are They Up To Now? Well, this week's feature is A.K. Fielding. Angelina completed writing and publishing her book entitled Rough Diamond. She is now busily promoting her book, which is a biography of one of Alexander Hamilton's son, who was a Midwest pioneer. She is also busy writing her next book, a biography on Abraham Lincoln called Abraham Lincoln Hoosier. Additionally, she has just started a small business venture in furniture and home decor. She will bring her passion for textile art that you can find in her handmade journals to this project along with her beautiful art. Congratulations to Angelina. Yeah. Yeah, That's pretty exciting publishing a book and now having it in distribution. You know, I re- I remember that episode. First of all, it was very popular. Yes, it was. And, and we talked about journaling, something that I personally have never done that I ever remember. Mm-hmm. But after that episode, I actually played around with it. Yeah, I can understand that. And I tried journaling when I was 11 or 12, but it didn't last too long. I think it lasted about two days. Very short-lived because... At 11 or 12, there was not a whole lot to journal about except my undying love for Donny Osmond. Oh, yes. Yes. Young girl's fascination with Donny oh, Osmond. Oh, gosh. Well, I, I consider that to be funny because I remember at ages, by age between 11 and 12, I had already written my first novel. Oh, yeah, right. And published it. <laughs> exactly. In your dreams, you did that, I think, right? Yeah, it was probably a dream. <laughs> Okay, so now let's hear your quote, Angie. Okay, the quote for this week is to send light into the darkness of men's hearts, such as the duty of the artist. And that is by Robert Schumann. Ah, Robert Schumann. Right. Uh, Great composer of music. Uh, piano music primarily, right? Yeah. He, what do you have about him? What do you well, have I, I looked him up because I don't know a ton about him. I know a little bit about him, but I, I thought I'd go ahead and read a little bit to our listeners so they might know a little bit about Robert. Great. Robert Schumann was a German romantic composer renowned particularly for his piano music, leader songs, which is chamber music and orchestral music. Many of his best known piano pieces were written for his wife, the pianist, Clara Schumann. If you, anybody that ever listens to classical music, on, especially on classical radio stations over yeah. the years, know who Robert Schumann is. Right. Um, hear his I wouldn't exactly say his household name like maybe Beethoven mm-hmm. or Mozart, 
but he definitely is extremely accomplished, beautiful music. If you have an opportunity to listen to some of his music, uh, you'll be excited to. And I also have to say, there's going to be a little surprise towards the end of the show. Yeah, during true. During our interview. But now we're, it's your turn, Rod. We're ready for Rod's motivational moment. Okay. This kind of percolated through what I experienced over this last few days. Mm-hmm. So here we go. To create your own restful heart, let your pet sit in your lap and you will know what unconditional love truly is. Oh, and that really was nice. because we've been watching our daughter's dog for over a week. Right. And the dog named Lucy. Yes. And when Lucy would jump up in my lap and I pet her and she'd hang around for a while, it made me feel really relaxed inside. It was it was kind of a, a very peaceful thing to do to have a an, a pet. I mean, it could be a cat. It could be any. Yeah, it could be any aunt pet, really. But what's interesting about pets is they do have undying love. They would they would die for you, basically, to protect you, a lot of dogs. And what's interesting is when you're petting them, is it actually releases uh, hormones in your body. I think it's oxytocin. Yeah, I think so, too. That makes you feel love and, and good. Well, they're, they're, dogs put up with a lot from us humans they and, do. uh, and they just show true unconditional love. Mm-hmm. So if you have a pet, have them hop up into your lap right now while you listen to our podcast. And belly rub. And belly, belly rub. You know, I really don't know if our very talented guest has a pet, but I do know she loves to go to the park and rejuvenate which I understand helps her creativity. That makes sense. It does make sense. And, you know, I remember when we were initially talking to her on the telephone before our interview today that she mentioned that. But um, I think now it's time for us to bring our guest, Yael Cherney, here with us today. Great. Yael, this interview with you is going to be a very special one because we'll get to listen to you perform a couple of your songs. Yes, we always appreciate it when we can share with our listeners what people love to do creatively with their voice and playing the piano. Hi, (laughs) thank you for having me. Oh, you got it. So before we officially start our interview, we always like to ask our guests what they had for breakfast. (laughs) Actually, I have fruits for breakfast. I eat very light. Uh-huh. <laughs> Actually, it takes me time to wake up in the morning. I'm that kind of a girl. But later on, <laughs> I compensate. Yeah, but I eat very light in the morning. Fruits, coffee, that's about it. Well, that's healthy. <laughs> that's What's your favorite fruit in the morning? Well, I'm in love with passifloras with passion fruits. Oh, okay. That sounds nice. I can eat passion fruits, yeah, all night long and all day long. (laughs) And mangoes and grapefruits, uh, you know, depends on on the season. I see. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) that makes sense. Those are seasonal. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You know what? Let's start with you telling us where you are speaking to us from right now. Yeah. Okay. So I'm speaking from where I'm based in, which is Tel Aviv, Israel. Although I was born in Boston, I grew up in Jerusalem. After a few years in Europe, in the States, I came back to Israel and I came back to Tel Aviv. Wow, that's a big city though, right? Yeah, that's the center of the culture and arts in Israel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can somehow relate it to New York in the States. This is where things happening in general. So for artists, that usually would be the place for us to live in. Yes. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Now, I know that yes. I know that you sing, but how old were you when you started to sing? Okay, so the history of the family says that I was very weird as a as a baby and <laughs> as a child and I actually I didn't speak till a very late age, till I was actually 3 and a half. Oh, wow. I yeah, but I did sing all the time and I drove my family and my parents crazy. So I I follow the cliche and I did sing before I could talk. Mm, Okay. But when I was, I think when I was five, when I was five year old, I asked to play the piano. I insisted on playing the piano. So I started playing the piano. 
nobody wanted to teach me because they wanted me to be, to know the language and to know how to write before I could play. But I insisted and convinced a piano teacher to teach me. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't satisfied with the piano. And so I asked my mom to look for a choir for me to sing in. And it took her, it took us till I was nine year old to find a professional choir. I wanted to sing in a professional choir. So we found a very professional choir in Jerusalem when I was nine year old. And it was a choir that used to travel all over the world and to sing with really the best orchestras and conductors. We sang with the Berliner Philharmonic. We sang with uh, the London Phil, with Zubin Mehta, with Claudio Abado, Mm. with Doreen Mazel, with really the big names. So ever since I was nine year old, I was actually in the professional scene of the classical musical world. And I had to audition all the time and I hardly went to school. And I lived, you could say, a life of a, of a mature, although yeah. I was quite a, a girl, a young girl, you can say, totally. You know, I, I, I have a young. question though for you. Did you, since you were doing this at such a young age, was this a lot of pressure for you? Did you feel like, you know, it was a little overwhelming sometimes? Mm-hmm. It was totally overwhelming and it was very, very stressing yeah. out, but it didn't really matter. Uh, I'll try to explain. I had to sing. It's something that I find hard to explain to people who don't have this need, Yeah. but I really, I had to sing. For me, not singing Schubert from the minute I, I sang Schubert in the choir. Right. I knew that it was my place. I knew that this was the place for me this was the, the way for me to be alive in a way. And I know it sounds very dramatic, but as a child, this is seriously how I felt. So although my parents were not only totally into this musical career mm-hmm. and uh, I cannot blame them because my childhood was full of stress, still they couldn't do anything about it because I really needed to think. Well, how, how old were you when you left Boston then? No, nothing. I was a two-year-old or something. I cannot remember anything. Oh, okay. I came back to Boston only when, only a few years ago when I was luckily invited to lecture there. And that was actually, for me, the first time being in, in Boston. I couldn't remember anything, but I did feel very at home. I was going to say, did you start your lecture by telling everybody this is my hometown, or at least that's where I was born? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, no, I, I didn't tell <laughs> I them didn't. anything about I didn't it. Think so. I didn't think so. <laughs> no, no, I didn't share that information. <laughs> okay, so you were just talking about developing the passion for music. I feel like with you, it was just from the moment you were born that you had this huge passion for music and you just really followed your passion. Tell us a little bit about that as far as. Where do you think that this passion comes from? You know, I'm not even sure it's passion. I think it's a need. Yeah. Like, uh, it's a need. I have music in my head most of the day and most of the night. Mm. Sometimes I find it very hard to just fall asleep because I can have Schumann in my head and it will be hard for me to just stop it. Yeah. I think it's, you know, there are uh, psychological problems in the world. And I think maybe, maybe musicians suffer from something that is totally neurologic. I, I don't know. Maybe it's in our brain. The music is just there. And I just leave talking to you and doing many actions in my life. But I parallelly have music in my head most of the day and the night. Well, that's, a, that's excellent. You know, that's really good. <laughs> yeah. No, not, not always. If I try <laughs> to read a book, if I try to read a book that I need to read, right, it can be a struggle for me. That, I think that's what helps you to be such an accomplished uh, soprano and classical singer. But, you know, the interesting thing is you also accompany yourself with the piano while you sing. I don't know how you can manage to do both of those talents at the same time. That seems tough. How do you do it? Well, it's it's very uncommon in classical music to singer to accompany her or himself on the piano. We don't do this. You're referring to to what what I'm specializing on, which is chamber music, which is Lieder, mm-hmm. the art song, the, especially the the German artistic song, which is uh, most times composed for a piano and a soprano or uh, any other kind of a singer. 
I don't call myself a pianist, but I do play the piano, let's say semi-professionally. I was encouraged by a very dear colleague of mine uh, a few years ago when I had to interview for the German uh, media and my pianist couldn't, couldn't show up at the last minute. So my colleague said, you know what, Yael, just accompany yourself, you can do this. So, so I was actually thrown to the water and I did it. And ever since I started recording myself doing it and giving concerts this way, because I did find that the combination of myself doing both things creates something that is very united and very whole. Mm -hmm. Very unique too. Very unique. Very yeah. uncommon. It's non-orthodox at all. And there are minuses in this format, let's say, let's be honest. But since the goal of chamber music is, is to aspire the ultimate, the ultimate togetherness, you can say, of musicians, I do manage to have this. Mm -hmm. There are no conflicts between me and another musicians. The piano and the voice are totally united. So the telepathy is perfect. It's not that I don't have criticism, you know, regarding my work. But on this aspect, I, I can say that this is, the piece is whole. There are no holes in it. It's the same mind expressed in two different instruments, the voice and the piano. Perfect. You know, I know Angie has... I do. Kind of an you interesting know, question. Knowing that you sing classical music, what other types of music do you sing? I think mainly classical music because I'm trained vocally this way. Mm -hmm. And if I try to sing something like rock or pop, I, I sound like a frog. I sound horrible. <laughs> oh, no. The only thing that I do flirt with is what you can say classical light music, such as mainly American early. 20th era century of uh, Gershwin and Jerome Kern, and of course, Bernstein, which is uh, half and half, you can say, sure. some of his uh, repertoires. Yeah. So um, when it comes to light jazz, light American music, I find myself completely comfortable there. But the uh, vocal production is totally, is, is mainly classical. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? Since we're on the topic of singing, this would be a great opportunity for you to sing something from one of your favorite pieces. Okay, so introduce your music selection and if you are accompanying yourself on the piano or not. Okay, so I think we can start with one of Clara Schumann's Lieder, in which I accompany myself on the piano as well. Mm -hmm. It's a Lieder by Heine. Uh, he wrote the lyrics, the wonderful, tremendous lyrics, and it's called Ich stand in dunklen which means I stood in a dark dream. Oh. Okay, great. Well, let's let's hear it. Und 
I suspected that was going to be wonderful. And it was. It was so nice. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Okay, now I have a question when I hear anyone saying, and I'm always curious, do you have certain things that you like to do before a performance to prepare you, yourself, and your voice? Well, being a classical singer is really, really demanding. You really have to make sure you're very extremely healthy. If you Mm -hmm. suffer from allergies, if you suffer from something very small, like coughing or whatever, any small thing affects us. So we are very vulnerable. Therefore, it's it's not for nothing that we're called many times divas mm-hmm, uh, because right. we ver- we protect we protect ourselves. But actually, we don't have any other way to handle this very fragile situation. So I have to say, I have to be honest. I cannot talk to anyone before I have to perform. I cannot communicate. I need to be. I have to concentrate, and I have to be in a silent situation. If someone refers to me, I can be, I can be very not nice. Let's say this. I need some peaceful time before, before I go on stage. That makes makes sense. sense. Sure. To focus, to focus. Get you in the, as they say, in the zone, right? Right. You're, you're where your mind needs to be so you can perform properly. What, what are your favorite classical pieces that you like to perform in? Hmm. Kind of like if you're in an opera performance, mm-hmm. for example, when there's other people mm-hmm. on the stage with you. So for me, it would be chamber music because that's what I mainly do. So um, my my favorite composers are Schubert, Schumann, Brahms. Brahms is actually my lover. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yes, uh, it's very serious between us. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, <laughs> Seriously, Brahms is, if someone says something bad about Brahms, I take it totally personally. Those are the composers I feel extremely connected to. They're like, they're part of my, bar, my, my blood. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sure. It's, it's, it's really in my skin. It's, it's inside me. See, that's so wonderful when you're, when you're feeling it from deep within you and you're singing and you're expressing yourself creatively like that. I think that's really what connects with the audience and what really resonates with people at that point because well, they're I, feeling I, something I, I from it. I also think those composers created music to be, to be shared, right? Yeah. And sung from the soul. And sung yeah. from the soul, from, from the, the heart soul. and not just somebody just passively singing. Right. Th- those people in my eyes, they put their real guts on the table and they said, This is who I am. And uh, they were very brave being able to share the the true soul and core with others. So the amount of respect that I share towards those people is incredible. And it took me, (laughs) I'll say this, it took me a long time to understand that actually they were human beings. They weren't something... (laughs) above. They were actually human beings. It's something that I, I can't say I really understand. Well, they, yeah, they certainly had their vulnerabilities like all human beings, but there was something really special and precious that they were able to lay down in music. Mm-hmm. That's so true. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I understand that you have another piece that you would like to share with us. And it's one of your favorite popular pieces. Can you sing that for us now? <laughs> yeah, tell us what, yeah, tell tell us us what it is. Tell though, us what you're going to sing. And, and tell us how you selected this from your repertoire. Okay. So I suggest we hear Embraceable You by George and Ira Gershwin, mm, uh, the brothers who I, I admire so much. American revolutionaries, both of them, extremely, extremely brave people in all terms. And Embraceable You, I think, is one of the, well, I, I can't grade Gershwin's pieces and, and, and standards, but there is something so pure in this, in this song, something so simple, you know, just Embraceable You, you know, the ability of someone to look at someone else mm-hmm. and just love him for what he is and not what he can produce or what, or not what he can give you, just, just loving uh, Someone that, else's soul. You know what? That's a, a beautiful way that you to set this up it. and to introduce it. Let's hear it. Embrace me, my 
An all-time classic, one uh, a piece of music that Americans dearly love, and thank you for sharing that with us. Yes, so romantic and gorgeous. (laughs) Beautiful. (laughs) Thank you so much. You're beautiful. You You know, I'd like to know what the differences are between being an artist and being an entertainer. That's a very complex uh, question. I'll, I'll I'll try to produce something that makes sense. In my eyes, first of all, there's a gray area in which Art can be entertainment and vice versa. But if I have to look at it, you know, in an extreme way and to define the two, I'll say that in my eyes, entertainment is something that created in order to assist someone to be out of himself, out of his core, out of his own body and soul, let's say this. Right. In Hebrew, the root of the word means to be spread away. Yeah to be unfocused. However, art, I think, asks the soul something completely else, maybe the opposite. It asks the individual to look inside himself and to reconnect with parts of his soul that usually in the daily life he's not connected with or she's not connected with. And it, it demands something else. It demands an intimacy of an individual with him or herself that is completely else than entertainment, maybe the very opposite. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I could see that though, you know, because if you're really like you are feeling what you're singing, I think there's a different dimension to your performance as opposed to someone that's just there to give you a good time. I mean, that's that's two different ways of entertaining. Yes, 
Yes, but I would like to mention that for me, being an audience to mm-hmm. a good entertainment is divine. The also, I think it's very spiritual to be out of yourself also, you know, and to be able to disconnect with yourself to something completely else. First of all, I think it's extremely healthy. Mm-hmm. But also, if I think in spiritual terms, sorry for my very spiritual language, I'm not a no, I'm no. Not a I, I, I think it's <laughs> fascinating. I love it. <laughs> yeah. I, I also think that entertainment, when it's really, when it's good, it can be divine, also in spiritual terms. Absolutely. So I'm not grading the entertainment to be something that is less. I just think it addresses different parts of the soul. Mm-hmm. Well, how about the audiences? You're performing in front of two different audiences. Which would be your favorite? Oh, like singing the pop, more popular <laughs> teens or, or the chamber yeah. music. Wow. Yeah. You know, I actually, I had a series with a comedian, an Israeli comedian, in which, you know, part of the concert was totally entertainment. And, and, and the audience left, which is something that, you know, in, concert, in the concert hall rarely happens. It's not our goal. Right, <laughs> right. I have to, yeah. And I have to say that it was extremely satisfying being able to make someone's laugh, someone laughs. It's just, it's wow. It's incredible. Because I think laughing is, it's such a deep uh, reflect, you know, it's something so authentic, just you cannot fake it. And I think both, I think if I made someone, I had the privilege uh, to be addressed by a physician who had a very complex surgery last week and he asked my permission to use my voice in the ER, yeah. Oh, that's so <laughs> that's neat. Um, wow. Yes. And actually, as someone who adores medicine, for me, it was one of the peaks, one of the, the highlight of my life, thinking that my voice can assist, you know, a surgeon in his divine, divine job. For me, I felt really privileged. And I, I told him, of course, do whatever you want. You're a physician. You're allowed to do anything you want in order to save life. So it moved me. It moved me a lot. I can imagine, you know, it, we need to kind of, I, I, I don't want to miss this next question that Angie has. Well, yeah. And, but I do want to say, I think that's the highest compliment you could ever yeah, get sure. having a doctor saying, I want this in ER because it's going to motivate and keep them up and going. Yeah. So really uh, nice. Medicinal. Yeah. Medicinal. Absolutely. Yeah. I, if, if I wasn't a musician, I would probably be a, a physician. Um, and, and for me, I felt like, wow, okay, so I didn't do it this way, but my, but somehow I managed to be present at this Mm -hmm. holy situation. Like for me, surgery is like, wow, the top, I admire this world. So I, I felt extremely privileged. I could see that. I mean, totally. Okay. Now I'm going to ask you a question that I have on my notes here before our time runs out. And you are a music conductor and I suspect that that's a very challenging occupation. Share with us how you got into conducting and how it inspires your own personal music. Well, I, when I was about 14, I, I heard Mahler and Brahms, Brahms' symphonies. I also sang in Britain's Wequiem with Kurt Mazur. And I, I was very intrigued and curious about the score, what the conductor held and where, where the notes of all the orchestras and the choirs and the soloists are, are. this is like the, the soul of the piece, mm-hmm. the, the notes themselves. So I was extremely curious about it. And I thought that the ability to have 120 people in front of you and navigate their interpretation and to express what Brahms wanted and what Malle wanted and to be in charge of this huge responsibility. I thought, wow, it's like being the pilot. It's like being so privileged to, to make Malle alive. Mm-hmm. And I thought that the symphonic, symphonic repertoire was so incredible. And as a singer, I had hardly any connection with it. So I had this dream when I was 15, that I was conducting Mahler. But there weren't any women conductors back then. Mm-hmm. I had no model. When I had, in Israel, we have to, we have to serve in the army. <laughs> so when I ended this chapter in my life, which was horrible, I decided 
I tried not to be a musician and I went and I studied philosophy for a while, but of course uh, it failed. And after a few months, I, I went to the academy in Jerusalem very impulsively and I told them I, want to get in, I wanted to get into the orchestral conducting department. It was an impulse. I never, I never planned it. I just took the bus and landed there. And I auditioned the, the next day and I got accepted. Mm, congratulations. Yes, that's wonderful. <laughs> Thank wow. you. That's a years ago. <laughs> and I was hardly in shape. I wasn't doing, I, I hardly dealt with music for, for two years. So it was, it was quite a miracle. And then when I, when I accomplished my, my first degree as we can, my artist degree, my BA here, I um, decided I'll go to the States and audition to my master's. And I did that. I hardly had any real experience with orchestras. We hardly had the opportunity to conduct orchestras back then. We had it only twice a year maximum. But luckily, I got accepted and I could choose where I would do my master's. So I, I went to the States and, and, I, and I kept on singing somehow parallelly to this. Well, you know what? That's that's pretty amazing that you're able to accomplish yes. that. That's just one of your many talents. And I also have to mention, maybe we can quickly discuss this, your book. Uh, in fact, that's how we found out about yeah, you. Yeah, that's tell so us true. A little, tell us the title and the topic of your book. And by <laughs> the way, I picked that up on Amazon and it is quite good. But tell us, tell us the title. <laughs> tell us your topic. Thank you. Yeah, so the title is classical music undressed. I wanted to share my knowledge as a musician, as a performer, and as a lecturer as well. So I actually wear three different hats. You can say I'm a conductor, I'm a soprano, and I'm a lecturer. I directed and I was the artistic director of many different festivals. And I also started a radio classical station in Israel. So I wanted to use, you know, all I somehow managed to gather during the years and I wanted to share it with the audience. During COVID time, all my stage activity was canceled and I thought at least I'll be useful to someone in this world. And I sat and I wrote this book in which I, try, I do several different things, but I, I refer to topics that you can say that mostly are not that discussed and, mm -hmm. and saved for the back scene stage. Let's, let's say these topics such as the artist's soul, what we, what we deal with as musicians, as performers from a young age, gender and music. It's not such a common knowledge for people to know that women were very, very uh, discriminated during history. And they paid price for this, but also men paid price for this, I have sure. to say. And I mention it, yes, in the book. We're going to have a link for your book. Absolutely, in our yeah. Show. I, I want to do kind of a follow-up question with that because that book is exciting to read and I know people will want to pick it up. But what I would like to know, in five words or less, what would you tell people that want to be more creative or live more creatively? Wow. I'm not sure I'm... I'm <laughs> I'm the address for this. I think what we lack in our time, modern times, I can say, is, is the ability to just stare at something. The ability to go to the park and stare at a tree and just be present at the moment and to be able to, to just be there and not thinking about how useful you are at the same moment or how good you are at the same moment or what else you have to accomplish in order to be okay in this world. I think the ability to just freeze, freeze yourself, you know, for an hour, for more, I think it enables something in the soul that in our era is, is hardly acceptable and hardly possible. Oh, I think that's a great answer. Yeah, that's a very that's good one answer. Of the best answers and so we've entirely true. It's so entirely true. Wow. And we, ha we have that opportunity because of where we live and we do try to focus on things that nature presents and just keep our mind focused on that. But, right, right. You know, yeah. I'm going to ask you the question we ask everyone on the show and I love their answers because they're very individual and very personal. 
And that is if you could sit on a park bench and chat with anyone from the past, who would it be? <laughs> so many to choose. I know. <laughs> I think I'll go for, <laughs> I think I'll go for Gershwin. Okay. Because Gershwin, Gershwin was a wild man who didn't follow any rule, was extremely brave. He wasn't provocative. It wasn't his thing, not in my eyes. He was truly authentic with himself and he served what he thought was best. His private life was, I, I, in my eyes, were, were incredible and, and he handled them very bravely. And of course, when it comes to the music, he, we owe him what, what, what we can now call jazz. And sure. yeah. Yeah. I think he was so brilliant. And yet he also another another extremely important thing about his personality, which I cannot say unfortunately about other composers, he had the ability to laugh at himself. And and humor was such a significant part of his work and his personality. And this is uh, for me the ability to laugh at yourself, you know, self-humor. I don't know if you have this term. Yes, of um, course we do. He, and you know what? Uh, okay. I think he would be very proud to know that you would like to sit on a bench with him. And I suspect oh, he would no. <laughs> I suspect he would greatly enjoy his conversation with you. Absolutely. You know, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This would be totally my honor when it comes to Gershwin. <laughs> well, you know, you're an extremely talented in so many creative ways. And you've been uh, wonderful to chat with both Inji and I really enjoyed chatting with you. Yes. And I thank you for sharing a bit of your creative life with us. Yes. Thank you. It was, it was an honor and I really enjoy talking to you seriously. Thank you so much. We did too. And we love how inspirational you are. And I think that our listeners are really going to feel your, the freedom you have to express yourself on many levels of creativity. So Thank you for that. That's so enlightening, I think. Thank you for enabling me this because it's a, it's a tango, as we said. You need two for this. And mm -hmm. thank you very much for just uh, asking those smart and sensitive questions and being such good listeners. It's a lot. Well, oh. you, you gave wonderful answers. Yes, you did. And then also I want to let our listeners know that if you'd like to know more about Yael, we will have links for her under the show guest tab on thoughtrowpodcast.com so everyone can learn more about her. And please link up with her on social media and check out her website. Yeah, you'll be, you'll be very impressed with her. Absolutely. So, goodbye for now. We yes, wish this thank could you have gone so longer. Much. You're such an interesting guest. I wish you the warmest regards and best wishes. Thank you so much. Okay, thank, thank you. 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 Bye-bye. I'm really glad you tuned in today. We hope you enjoyed the thoughts and ideas we shared with you. We post a new podcast every week, so remember to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss an episode. So it's bye for now from my husband Rod and I, wishing everyone a great day.